about his child. Naomi Richards, a, the psychologist at the University of Indianapolis, has done many studies on favoritism and has said that it has terrible effects on siblings. According to a study by Claire Stalker, a research professor of developmental psychology, showed that those children who felt less loved than the other children in their family were more likely to develop anxiety, depression, confidence issues, and in some cases, behavioral problems. Stephen Scott, a professor of child health and behavior, did a study on twins and has said that even in twin pairs, parents pick favorites. And the least favorite of the twins often struggles in school, has fewer friends, is antisocial, and is often ornerier than the other, more favored twin. He also stated that this misbehavior could be a cry for the parents' attention. <clears throat> However, life is at all bad for the least favorite child. Naomi Richards, who does confidence building workshops, has said that being the least favorite child can help develop a person into someone who has drive and determination, copes well with upsets, and has better social skills than that of the other children in their family. Likewise, life isn't all good for the favorite child either. The favorite child often gets things handed to them, and in some cases has never even been told no. Professor Stephen Scott states that it can sometimes come as a bit of a shock to realize you're perhaps not quite as great as your parents led you to believe. The favorite child also often gets the, it has problems handling criticism, which can make it difficult when they're thrown into the real world. Indeed, favorite children do exist. Maybe you are one of them, or maybe you are the LFS in your family. Regardless, it seems as if having a favorite child is something that cannot be avoided. What can be avoided is being obvious about it. Oscar Wilde once said, the best way to make children good is to make them happy. And you can make your children happy by treating them fairly despite your feelings of favoritism. <laughs> What is bravery? Is it a medieval knight riding into battle? Is it a skydiver or a bungee jumper? Is it a cancer patient going for chemotherapy? Or is it somebody standing up for a person that is bullied? All of these examples are probably true. There are many ways of showing one's bravery. One particular man, however, showed ultimate bravery by sacrificing himself and saving his friends' lives. The Man with the Broken Fingers by Carl Sandberg. The man with the broken fingers throws a shadow. Down from the spruce, an emigreen mountain timbers of Norway, and across Europe and the Mediterranean, to the oasis palms of Libya. He lives and speaks a sign language of lost fingers. From a son of Norway who slipped the Gestapo nets, the Nazi patrols, the story comes as told among those now in Norway. Shrines in the hearts they have for this nameless man refused to remember names, 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 the Gestapo wanted. Tell us these names. Who are they? Talk. We want those names. And a man faced them, looked them in the eye, and hours passed, and no names came. Hours on hours, and no names for the Gestapo. They told him they would break him, as they had broken others. The rubber hose slammed around face and neck. The truncheon, pending pain with no telltale marks, or the distinction of the firing squad and death in a split second. The Gestapo considered this and decided for him something else again. Tell us those names! Who were they? Names now, or else! And no names came, over and over, and no names. So they broke the little finger of the left hand. Three fingers came next, and the left thumb bent to the broke. Still, no names, and there was a day and night for rest and thinking it over. Then again, they demand for names, and he gave them the same silence. And the little finger of the right hand felt itself twisted, back and back, twisted till it turned loose from a bleeding socket. Then three more fingers cracked and splintered, one by one, and the right thumb back and back into, into a shattered bone. Did you think about violins or accordions you would never touch again? Did you think of baby or woman here you would never even play with? Or of hammers or pencils, no good time anymore? Or of gloves and mittens that would always be misfits? He may have laughed half a moment over his <coughs> apple bell, 
So now for a while, he was handling neither knife nor fork, nor lift his lips any drinking cup handle, nor sign his name with a pen between thumb and fingers. And all this was halfway. There was more to come. Like a sap would have been cracked and angry. They wanted to know in Norway the step like a sap would be terrible. They wanted a wide whispering of fear how the Nazis and those who won't talk or tell names. We give you one more chance to cooperate. Yet, he had no names for them. His lock time, his Norwegian will, pitted against Nazi will. His pride and faith in a free man's way. His welcoming death rather than do what they wanted. They brought against this their last act of fury. Breaking the left arm at the elbow. Breaking it again at the shoulder socket, and when he came to, in the flicker of opening eyes, they broke the right arm, first at the elbow, then the shoulder. By now, of course, he had lost um, all memory names, even his own. And there are those, like you and me, and many, many others, who can never forget the man with the broken fingers. His will, his pride as a free man, shall go on. His shadow moves, and his sacred fingers speak. He tells the men, there are a thousand writhing, shattering deaths. Better to die one by one than to say yes, yes, yes. When the answer is no, 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 then death is welcome, and death is soon, and death is a quiet step into a sweet, clean midnight. Move the 
spots on the beach. Romantic dinner. <laughs> really, you can get close to you. It's not a disease. It's more like an injury. An accident. I had the umbilical cord wrapped around my neck a few times. I managed to throw a few knocks in the suckle while I was at it. A blind girl scout. No one had any warning I was going to be like this. Not enough oxygen to the brain and bam, CP. I wasn't some two pound free me either. I was a healthy nine pounder. And that is what takes me off. Up until the point of delivery. I was normal. I have what is called spastic CP. Which is why I run around and jump all the time. I'm spastic. I wish. I really can't do any of those things. What spastic really means is... I'm a bit stiff. And my movements are a bit jerky. Because my muscles are too tight. I have a hard time relaxing them. Come and shake my hand, and you might not get it back. I ripped it right off the wrist. Nice to meet you, Jane. Oh my gosh, she's torn off my hand! <laughs> <laughs> At least spastic CP is the most common CP. So, amongst the CP community, I am normal. Yeah, normal. It's just, I'm not even CP normal. That was a lie. Sometimes I really feel shattered. About the whole walking thing. You see, I was mainstreamed into regular classrooms since kindergarten. Mom, sister. The teachers told all the kids that I was normal. And of course they did it right in front of me, gesturing and motioning like I'm some inanimate object. A bowl of plastic fruit. Hey, dude, I'm sitting right here. I don't think they... The teachers truly believe that was normal. But over the next few years, I did make a few friends. You mean one? Okay, one. He was hot for an eight-year-old. Creepy. At my age. I was eight at the time. Still creepy. But I remember... He talked to me like I was normal. He was my inspiration to walk. And I did. Man, it felt good. I lived one block from the school, and one day, Mom let him walk me home. Yeah, standing 50 feet behind. But then came third grade. Bam, Bam. CP. I started having trouble with my hips. Mom set me up for surgery to get things fixed. Things were all downhill from there. They put in all sorts of nuts and bolts. Her so bad. Three surgeries. Severe. Constant pain. They put in plates, pins, a mid-70s Buick. Okay. Maybe not the Buick, but it felt like it. The pain went away, but I was never going to walk again. I hit my prime at nine. These good old legs of mine logged in less than a mile. Shame. They were good looking legs too. We have chat down for the rest of my life. I wanted to scream. I wanted to run. I prayed and prayed and prayed to God. I wanted it so bad. So bad. Back to the chair. I wish I could make my story more tolerable by saying my friend moved away. But the truth is, he just stopped being my friend. Can't really blame him. Third graders aren't the most patient soul. Lots to run around, things to do and see. And I was just too damn slow. Look, I'm 25 years old. I know others with CP have it worse than me, and I should be grateful. But sometimes, when I look at myself, I just shake my head. Others with CP walk, drive. I even heard of a girl who got her motorcycle license. They have tons of friends, fall in love, marry, have kids, shop it. I'd be lying if I said I haven't entertained the idea of ending it all. 
fighting the proverbial bullet. But I wouldn't let me. The funny thing about it was that what if I changed my mind? After I already had a gun in my hand. And my spastic grip would have let me let go. I wouldn't be able to go outside and get help. The people outside would think that retarded girl in the wheelchair.